Welcome back. Most of what we're going to do in this class is very, very, very simple materials. And we, we, we will get a lot out of that. But I, I want to spend tonight um, going over uh, more interesting materials, at least classifying ways that materials can complicate or enrich the problem or, or system that you're designing or, or analyzing. Okay? So, and I think by doing that, we're gonna, you're going to see, you're going you're gonna to begin to understand how you can track or how you can, how you can attack a, a, a problem with an interesting material. Uh, by, and and, and it's, you can't do everything all at once, but you can, you can take it in one direction and then another direction and see what, see what happens. So the first thing I want to remind you of is the relationship between D, the electric field D, and the electric field E. Okay? And what we mostly will do is we will be talking about simple relationships between D and E. And in this case, I've covered up the, the polarization, the macroscopic polarization. And I just have the contribution due to vacuum or to free space. All the materials, which is the subject of this lecture, is going to be in P. Similarly, we write for the relationship between B and H, a relationship that, that's, that governs free space, and then the magnetization, the macroscopic magnetization, which is the material response. Okay. Now, very often, Very often, the material might be related linearly to the electric field through a susceptibility, a dimensionless susceptibility. And similarly, the magnetization can be related to H through a magnetic susceptibility. So this, this is a, these are simple materials. And if you substitute these in, you'll see that D is equal to epsilon naught, epsilon r times E, where epsilon r is equal to, <coughs> do you remember what it is? One plus, X. One plus chi E. I, I'm sloppy with that X, which means it's the Greek letter chi. Okay. And similarly, B, is epsilon is mu naught uh, mu sub r times h, where mu sub r is one plus chi m. So these are for simple materials. So for simple materials, um, everything everything about that material is just lumped into a constant. Okay, that's and that, and and I, and I want to emphasize that. This is what we're going to use most of the time in this class. Very, very rarely will we, will we get a chance to do something that's, that's cool and interesting from a material perspective. As long as that's a constant, as long as we have simple materials, Maxwell's equations are cake. They're absolutely easy. Because they're just a set of coupled first order differential equations, partial in space and time, but they have constant coefficients. And so they are completely right for any kind of, of uh, linear time invariant analysis, Fourier transforming, or what have you. Fourier transforming not only in time, but also in space. Conjugate variables at x, y, and z. Okay? And, that, and so that's, and we're going to do all that. We're going to do all of that. But tonight I, want, tonight I want to indulge us a little bit and talk about the compl complications in materials interesting 
M and P. Okay? And I'm, I'm going to do so in a way that classifies these complications. So we're going to go through a certain number of them separately and independently on all the, on the ways that things can be hard. So linear versus nonlinear materials. So a material is linear, a material is linear, if the response of the material is constant with respect to, with respect to the amount of the field. Let me back up just a touch. I mentioned this before, but I want to talk a little bit about, about this. I want, to write, I want to sketch this out. So I need MMP to go into electromagnetics if I'm going to do an interest, if I'm going to study an interesting materials. Quantum mechanics describes the environment or the response of the electromagnetics with the material. That response added up over an ensemble gives me my M and P. Okay. So this is our course here. You've got two other courses to worry about before you can close this loop. And it is a loop. So you have to assume a field, do the quantum mechanics, do the summation, the averaging of the ensemble, and redo your, your electromagnetics which redoes your quantum mechanics, which redoes your stat mech, until you close on that and, to, and you converge into a solution that's, a, that's precise enough for what you want. Okay. There's a few other tricks on that. So, if epsilon is now a function of the field, then we have nonlinearities. Now, think about where this can happen, right? Remember, the electric field is the harbinger of the force on an, on an electron. And so if I've, if I've got a crystal, and I've got these atoms in the crystal, and I've got the electron clouds around the atoms of the crystal, and they're sitting there, and they're really happy in equilibrium. So I've got these clouds of electrons, that, that, that they, and they may be vibrating, they may be moving, but they're pretty happy. I come in with a little bit of light. I come in with a little bit of an electric field. And that pushes the clouds of electrons around. Okay? As long as those clouds of electrons don't go very far, they'll just, they'll just take the input and re-radiate it, maybe with a delay, maybe with an amplitude, modulate, an amplitude reduction. Classic linear time invariant system response to a sinusoid. Phase delay and an amplitude change, usually in attenuation. Loss and phase shift. Okay? And an absorption and an index of refraction. 
We'll talk about that case in much more detail later on. If I up the voltage per meter on the electric field, these electrons will see more forces. And they'll start to squat, they'll start to move around. And in fact, they might actually pull the lattice atoms closer together or further apart. And in that instance, the material density or the material properties are going to change. And so the number that describes the response now becomes a function of the electric field. So think about the way you guys are all organized in this room, in rows and in columns. Right? You all have your own personal space around you. If there's enough force on you, if I walk down the aisles, and I used to do this when I was younger and not on camera, I'd start moving the desks together and further apart, really agitating the class. It was really fun. But that mimics, that mimics the nonlinear response of that, of that lattice. Okay. Now you've, you've heard, you've learned the formal definition of linearity, which means that superposition of inputs gives you a superposition of outputs. I'll just remind you of that. So if I have a system and I have an input X and I have an output Y, if I have two inputs, X1 and X2, giving you two outputs, Y1 and Y2, if I scale this and I scale that and I add them together, I'll get this just the same weighted average, that's the same weighted superposition of the output. That's the, the formal mathematical definition for linearity. Okay? And if you have a mathematical description of your system, you can plug this in and you can figure out whether or not that holds, nine times out of ten. But if I throw you a, a crystal, or I throw you a block of material, and I say, prove that it's linear, this is a really bad prescription in the laboratory. Because this has to hold for all x's and y's, and it has to hold for all a's and b's. And you'll be here all night and you won't even, you won't even make a dent in the permutations of all of those. So linearity has a better experimental test. And that is if you generate new frequency components. If you, generate, if you, if you send in a kilohertz and all of a sudden you've got outputs at 2 kilohertz, you know you can't get that new frequency any other way but a nonlinearity. A linear time invariant system is only going to change the amplitude and the, and the phase. It's not going to create new colors. So that's really, the, that's really the one fabulous test in a laboratory of whether you have a nonlinearity or not. Is if you, if you put in a sinusoid and you crank up the, the voltage on that sinusoid, you start to see a different frequency. In a mechanical system, you have a speaker that's vibrating in time to the music. Okay? You keep that, you keep your volume low, like your parents or your house counselor told you to when you were young. And you'll get a faithful reproduction of the music that's driving the speaker. As soon as the house counselor went away, I cranked up my music. And what happens sometimes is I would crank it so far up that it would run out of travel. The speaker would run out of travel and it would bang against the rails. And so my sinusoid wasn't a sinusoid anymore. It clipped. It cut off. And this distortion, this harmonic distortion, this clipping has to introduce higher frequencies. See that slope discontinuity? The only way you can turn that angle is by having higher frequencies. This is looking more and more like a square wave. And square waves are a sum of an infinite sum of these things. So that's, that's sort of the premise. And in fact, harmonic distortion is a great, is, is a formal spec for sound systems. You know those little laser pointers that are green? 
the green laser pointers? There's a laser in there. It's one of the reasons they call it a laser pointer. And that laser is, is emits light at one micron. One micron is in the infrared, not very far in the infrared, but it's in the infrared and you can't see it. It's a couple hundred nanometers or so, maybe 300 nanometers or so, 400 beyond your, your vision. So you can't, see, you can't see the one micron. But it astounds me that they put in front of that one micron laser, they put, in, they put a little, a little nonlinear optical crystal. And so that red light, that one micron light, turns a fraction of it turns into green light at half a micron, 500 nanometers. Okay. So that's so that's where so that's um, that's an example in your nowadays in your everyday life of nonlinear optics. And I'm, I'm just blown away by that because I, I made those I used to make those systems that I would take days on an optical table to design it, to cut the crystals, design it, and and, and, and then align it, and then try not to blow the face off the crystals with the high power that I was, that I was shoving through it. So one, fix of, so, so one way you might describe this is with an electric, with, the, with a relationship. It looks something like that, a Taylor series expansion of D into E. And all these quadratic and cubic and quartic terms are what leads to the new frequency generations of that. Looks like a diode. Input output looks like a diode. The quantum mechanics and the statistical mechanics can also be used to derive other kinds, other forms. And this is one of my favorite forms. It has a saturation denominator. So the nonlinearity is found in this denominator term, this E squared term in the denominator. If E is very small, you can neglect it, and you have a pretty nice linear response. As E gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the material runs out of juice. And so the denominator gets bigger, you ignore the one, and the response of that material goes further and further and further down. So that's another, another kind that happens to work well in materials that saturate. For example, in a laser where you're pumping energy into your material and you only have a finite amount of energy to pump. Your output power can never equal the input power or exceed the input power of the laser, so you know at some point you're going to run out of gain. Backing up to a higher level, your linear time invariant system of Maxwell's equation with these kinds of substitutions becomes nonlinear. You can't Fourier transform them. Any harmonic analysis is going to run you into extra and extra extra terms. It could be very, it could be very, very interesting on how you exactly are going to handle that. So nonlinear systems like the like the simple laser pointer that I was talking to you about, those are really that's a really interesting set of mathematics. Okay, and you can pretend to, well, you could start to imagine how you might take Maxwell's equations, substitute this, these in, and you'll be left with a nonlinear differential equation. And there are a handful of differential equations that are nonlinear that have solutions to them. Not to boast, but I solved one by luck in grad school. Maybe a lot of work in grad school, a lot of silly work in grad school. I didn't have much of a social life. 
But, or you run to a computer and do numerical solutions. And there's a fabulous field of study um, that used to be much more popular, nonlinear dynamics. Couple nonlinear sets of differential equations. And it leads to wonderful things like chaos, the butterfly effect, chaos theory, and so on. And that all comes from the nonlinearities of a material that's inserted into your system. So that's what happens if things change, your material changes with respect to the amount of the field. The response of the system is uniform with respect to, to, um, to space, is a homogeneous material. If it isn't, it's an inhomogeneous material. And I now have a dielectric constant that varies with position. So if you think of some of the FET devices, some of the microelectronic devices, you might, be able, you might dope one area differently from another area. And by doping with different atoms, you'll change the dielectric coefficient in one region versus another region. And you might, be able, you might do that in a very gradual way. So that, so, that you, so that it's not a block, a not block, so you can separate it nicely, but there might be a gradient in that doping as you move through it. And that can be very complicated. Now you're solving differential equations, Maxwell's differential equations. When you put the material in, into those equations, you're solving them with non-constant coefficients. Non-constant coefficients. Okay, so your, 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 your differential equations have a complexity. And those are, those are, that's a class of equations that we don't we shy away from, from undergraduate differential equations. But there are some out there that you can solve. And, 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 and that's a possibility. And again, you run with your tail between your legs to a computer to do a numerical solution for those. Okay? The fiber optic cables that take your, the communication signals from one city to another city are little tiny strands of glass. They're engineered so that they, the active area of the glass is about nine microns. So that's how, much, that's how far you focus the light into that glass. The index profile in that glass is quadratic. They use germanium doping and they engineer it so that there's, within that nine microns, there's a nice quadratic curvature. That helps the mode, the shape of the electric field and magnetic field inside that glass. It helps keep it there, it helps move it along and confine it in, a, in an advantageous way. Okay. That's an example of an engineered system that uses an inhomogeneous or a, or a responsive material that is is non-uniform with respect to space. And again, it's another example of doping, changing the materials. If you pause and you think a little bit of that, about that one, nine microns, that's really small. You're cramming a lot of volts per meter into that small area. You're keeping the light in that small area in some instances, for nine megameters, 9,000 kilometers across the Pacific. That's right for a lot of nonlinearities in addition in that system. So one of, the, one of the key engineering issues, one of the most fundamentally important engineering issues in glass fibers communications 
is nonlinearity. And this is, um, in, in, coincidentally, it's also an example of an inhomogeneous system. Okay? So some materials, sometimes you can get both. Sometimes you'll have two problems at once. Okay? But if you treat them separately, or at least classify them separately, I think you'll stay saner for just a little bit longer. Okay? If we have time, I'm going to go through a couple of examples of nonlinear, a nonlinear problem and an inhomogeneous problem um, today. If not, we'll bleed over to the next meeting. But let me give you a, a third example of a complexity. So hysteresis, it sounds like history, and that's actually important. The reason why that material might depend on the history of the field, and remember this is electromagnetic, so we care the response of the material to the field, not to other things, not to pressure, not to temperature, or anything like that. It's the field. So what happens is when we apply a field somehow, the material stores that energy. So it keeps that energy. And so it's a changed material because it's stored in some way, some manifestation, it's stored that energy. The most famous example of this remember we're talking about D to E and B to H so I'm going to, I'm going to present a plot of B versus H so if this were a simple material one we'll, we'll be using again and again and again will just be a straight line and the straight of that line, that straight, that the, the slope of that line will be mu, right? But B versus H magnets, ferro, ferro magnets, you know, iron magnets, they they exhibit a very interesting property. If I apply a field, I'll see a saturation behavior. But what's really interesting is if I go back I won't come down in the same place I mean, I'll go all the way negative and then I'll come down and I'll saturate on the other side changing H so it's minus then if I increase H from less and less and less minus to more and more and more positive. Again, I'll switch back, but not at the same place. Do you remember Poynting's theorem? And in particular, do you remember that if I multiply B times H, I get the energy? Well, take a look at this area here. And that looks like a B multiplied by an H to me, or an integral of B over H. So this area here is the energy. It's related to the energy. Now, if you think about what's going on, if you think about what's going on, with this magnet, you have small domains in your metal structure. 
very small magnetic domains in your, magne in your, in your, in your, in your structure. And at first, these magnetic domains are pointed any which way. So they average out to point nowhere, randomly. If you apply a magnetic field, however, you apply a torque onto these magnetic domains, so they all begin to line up together. So you've done work, you've fought against entropy, the disorder, you've, your work has, has organized, put in place all these magnetic domains, and now they're all lined up with the North Pole and the South Pole. If you now swing back the other way, you're doing the work of flipping each and every one of those domains back the other way. So as you cycle back and forth, back and forth, you're flipping all these magnetic domains. You're going back through and you're doing the work of flipping that out. I like this example because it reminds us that entropy is related very much to work and energy. Something I didn't appreciate until I had young kids. And I was spending, you know, every few hours I had to go back and clean up their blocks or their Legos or their toys. And there's nothing that says you're doing actual work when for the 20th time that day you're picking up block after block and putting it neatly in its little tray, one after the other, one after the other. You start calculating the joules that you're using to move from random disorder to a nice organized. Fighting the entropy. And that's exactly what's going on here. So, so an interesting form of energy can be order. It can be organization. And that's what's going on with this. Okay. So if I put these into Maxwell's equations, it looks like I need to have integral, integrals over past states of fields. I have to do integration over past states of field, integrations with over time, over the history of the materials. And so my, par my partial differential equations now have additional convolution integrals in them. And that can be a pain. For an isotropic material, yeah. could you just put that in the room? Absolutely. Sorry. For an isotropic material, the response to the material is uniform with respect to the direction of the field. So whether remember these fields are vector fields, so they may point in the x direction versus the y direction versus the z direction. And so if the response to the material matters, whether the electric field, for example, is, is pointed in the x direction versus the y direction, then you have an anisotropic material. Uniform with respect to direction is isotropic. Non-uniform with respect to direction is anisotropic. A very important example of this is Polaroid sunglasses. So Polaroid sunglasses, it starts with a plastic. Plastic is long, 
molecular chains of high molecular weight, long carbon chains of molecular, high molecular weight. You heat it and you roll it between two rollers. By rolling it between two rollers, the mechanical force actually rotates those molecules so that they line up. If you put a little bit of dye on them, you get an absorber that absorbs more into a field in one, in one direction than the other direction. Okay. And that's really useful because supposing you're at the beach, the light will come through your sunglasses, but it will also bounce off the water and come up into your eyes. The, the, the light that bounces off the water is shimmering because the water is moving. It's not perfectly still. And so that's creating a shimmer or a clutter or a glare. The, the action of the light as it bounces off that surface, however, is preferentially polarized in the horizontal plane. So if I line up my sunglasses to absorb that horizontal component, I see the light that's undisturbed by the, by the glare minus the light of the glare off the, off the ocean or off the lake. And it makes it much easier to see the volleyball that you're trying to hit or the can of Coke that you're trying to reach for. Okay? So that's, that's, that's an important everyday application of an anisotropic material that's been mechanically arranged to do that. Another example is think about a crystal, the crystal lattice. Very few crystal lattices are equally spaced. So if you sit at a silicon atom, for example, or a gallium atom in the gallium arsenide structure, you don't see your nearest neighbor in, in that direction is different from your nearest neighbor in that direction and that direction. So the density is different in one direction versus the other direction, which means your dielectric constant is going to be proportional to that and different. So crystal structures are an example where you have an anisotropic material because the density of the particles change depending on what direction you, you have. And you can play great, you can have great fun and play games by cutting your crystals along different planes that are, or that are different to, the, to different crystals. And so you'll have different dielectric constants in different spatial directions depending on exactly how you cut this crystal that you grew. Okay? And so that, so that, that, creates, that creates a whole new engineering um, set of calculations that you can do to... Uh, to optimize the system, polarizing system, or nonlinear optical system, or what have you. Question: Would, uh, like you were describing the silicon atoms, would those still be considered homogeneous, even though the uh, constant is? It's different? the same with respect to space, because if you have a perfect lattice, the lattice is exactly the same over here as it is over here. Okay. But it's anisotropic because it's, it depends on the direction of the field. That's why I'm, great question, thank you so much. That's why I'm separating out isotropic from anisotropic, from homogeneous and inhomogeneous. Because you could have one or not the other. Okay? And in that case, it's a great example. But let me give you an idea of where things get hard on this. I have a dx, a dy, and a dz. Because the d is a vector, and the e is a vector. Okay. So if I'm going to deal with things that change as a function of this direction of the field, I'm going to decom deco I've got to decompose my, my, my vectors. So I have a dx that's related to the electric field, and I have a dy that's related to the electric field, and I have a dz that's related to the electric field. My X, Y, and Z has nothing to do with the silicon atom or the gallium arsenide atoms, right? I can arrange it to be such, but a priori it's not. The crystal doesn't know who I am or what my favorite choice of X, Y, and Z is. Doesn't know which direction is up. But I do have to account for each component of the electric field.
So dx is some combination of ex, ey, and ez, each with their own constants, each with their own dielectric constants. And a priori, I have no, no, no knowledge of whether of what one is versus another one. Same can be said for dy. And for dz. So I went from one number to nine numbers. And in truth be told, this is actually fairly easy to deal with. It's just bookkeeping. Because you still have, if, if all these are just constants, you still have a linear set of equations. And so you can, you can, you can figure out the right axis, the right x, y, and z orientation for your crystal. And you can, you can write Maxwell's equation not in their neat, nice, neat form, but broken out by, by, um, by components. And you've got more equations, but it's still a couple set of you know, constant coefficient differential equations. So this is, this is a, a bookkeeping nightmare, but it's not fundamentally hard like a nonlinear case or an inhomogeneous case, where you could, in fact, very easily stumble onto a differential equation that you cannot solve. As long as these are, this is your only complexity and these are just constants, you could, you could, if, you're, if you're patient and work through the bookkeeping, you can, you can handle it. Now, I hope everyone has already come to the conclusion that we should collect all these things in, in, in a matrix And so we can write things like that. Now let me tell you what anisotropy means to me. If I have a, if I have a tank of water, like a fish tank of water, and in the, in, the, in the middle of that fish tank of water, in the middle of that fish tank of water, I have a little source, a little light bulb. And that light bulb, is a perfect light bulb that emits in, in all directions. The speed at which the, that, the light waves travel is going to be the same in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. So the phase fronts, or the fronts that, that's from the disturbance, the, if, the, if it's just one instance of a disturbance, these are going to be circular, or rather spherical. Because in each direction, the information that leaves, the light that leaves that, that, that light bulb travels the same, direct, same speed. So at this number of a foot a nanosecond, so one nanosecond later, here and here, they all, all those photons began at the same time. Okay. If, I have this, if this is the case, however, and I repeat my experiment, but now I'm in a crystal. The distance here may be slow relative to the distance here and here. The speed in this direction may be slower than in this direction or this direction. So instead of a soccer ball, I now have a squash soccer ball or something closer to a rugby ball or a football. And so, and so circles for isotropy, isotropy ellipses and ellipsoids for, for anisotropy in terms of the phase fronts that leave the, the beginning. We have to get comfortable with what a phase front is. So store that. When we solve our Maxwell's equations, we'll have to think, we'll have to consider that. But for now, it's an abstract concept where the light is emitting, and it takes a certain amount of time to go in this direction, this direction, and this direction, 
and whether they're equal or not gives you spheres or not. Think about it this way. I have a lake, I have a, I have a pond, I throw a rock, the waves that leave that rock, the ripples that leave that rock are circles because the speed in one direction is the same as the speed in the other direction. If I was able to do something weird to that lake so that my ripples in the north-south direction were much slower than in the east-west direction, I wouldn't have circles, I'd have an ellipse. Okay. If I made the isotropic water anisotropic, that's what would happen. Now, there are two things that I didn't mention. Okay? So, I will, stop, I, can, I will pause here and say that these complications, linear, nonlinear, homogeneous and homogeneous, hysteresis, non-hysteresis, and isotropic and anisotropic, are the only complications that you'll face. It's the only classification of materials, complexities, that you need. I'm begging some disagreement. I'm going out on a limb and hoping that somebody notices that statement. It's a strong, strong, strong statement. Are there material classifications that you guys have run across? That are not that I that are not part of these four. I bet. Well, let me go one direction. I mentioned inhomogeneous was changing with respect to x. Right? Well, remember, my Maxwell's equations are differential equations in x, y, z, and time. So why didn't I mention anything that changed with respect to time? Why haven't I talked about that? Why can't the material be time bearing? If it, it, it's the word for that is stationary, but why can't the material be non stationary? Because the field is not time. Well, the field can vary as a function of time, but this is the response of the material relative to that time. So the response of the material is changing independently of that time. So the index of refraction of a material would change as a function of time. Or the density of the material would change as a function of time. Is that possible? Well, in some sense it is. In some sense it is possible. If I take a block of glass and I, I glue a little transducer onto it and I hammer away at it, I create a density wave, the sound is a density wave, and the index of refraction will form a really nice grating, and I can scatter my light off of that grating, that's done all the time. Surface acoustic wave devices, uh, acousto-optic modulators, that's a very, so that's, you can buy these things. But I have a hard time, so I, I, the way I prefer to write that, the way I prefer to write that, you can, and, and, and you're perfectly okay to say that it changes as a function of time. But what I prefer to write that is to include two or three or four or twenty more equations that describes the dynamics of that, of that, of that element as, as, as additional time dependencies, as additional differential equations, for example. So I, 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 choose, I, choose, to, I, I choose mathematically to pull that out and, and model it in a, in a different way. In other words, it's changing because I'm changing it. There's an applied voltage, and there's a there's a there's a mechanical electromechanical system set of equations that I can use to describe that. 
And so at any instant, I have the same, I have a system that's, that's instantaneous and it's just tracking this whole other set of equations. So this is your choice. Now, there's another one that usually people pick up on. This dielectric constant is a number, right? And that number is 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter, right? Still hoping somebody says it. It's not complex. So, have you guys ever worked with complex materials where epsilon is equal to epsilon real plus i epsilon imaginary? Or maybe you wrote it epsilon prime plus i epsilon double prime? Complex materials. Has anyone ever worked with that? No? I can't believe that. I remember it from EMAC. Good. I don't remember what it was for. Okay, that's fine. If you assume sinusoids, then you can then you can worry about then you can have e to the i omega t's. Okay? If you want to. And in that limit, you can have consider a material response that has a real part and an imaginary part. The imaginary part is the loss. And I just choose to model the loss as sigma. So sometimes people will, will work, describe an absorption or a loss or attenuation of the field, and they'll be considering the complex part of epsilon. They'll, they'll want to put that loss in the epsilon term and call it a complex material. Very, very commonly done. Okay? I just want to point out that you don't need to do that. That you can put all your loss in the conductivity term, the sigma term, where Poynting's vector says it belongs, where Poynting's theorem says it belongs. Capacitive storage, inductive storage, and dissipative term is the sigma e squared term. So we will, we, other people do it, and we will work with complex materials. But it's not a fundamental complexity of a material. It's not a fundamental part of a material. There's no physical interpretation. There's no, the square root of minus one is imaginary. It really doesn't exist. And you really don't need it from a physical level. You might find it extremely useful in your bookkeeping of your mathematics. So, so simple, so, so useful that you'd be silly to not use it. But you don't really need it because you have, because physically a complex material just models a reactive part and a loss part, an index of refraction and an absorption. And you're going to put that new information somewhere, you can put it in sigma where it, I feel it's more physically, where it more physically belongs. Now, that's a, that's a physical interpretation and it's a very, that's a very personal thing, right? So I just share with you my viewpoint on it. You don't have to, you certainly don't have to adopt it. Well, a lot of people don't. Okay? All right. Let me close this lecture with a little bit of an example. Or two, actually. 
to talk about that, that does a simple problem, uh, one for an inhomogeneous material and one for a nonlinear material, just so you get a sense of what, of what, what things are doing. So I want to do one dimension. I want to find the electric field ex of x, a sub x, and I want to find it in terms of rho of x, the arbitrary charge distribution, for an inhomogeneous material and I'm going to be careful about this, epsilon of x is equal to a constant term plus something that's linearly changing in, in epsilon, in x. So this is a simple doping gradient. Okay? This is a simple doping gradient. Now, Del dot D is equal to rho. E is equal to epsilon rho. I'm sorry, epsilon E. I'm sorry, geez. D is equal, D is equal to epsilon E. And so I'll have E times the gradient of epsilon plus epsilon times the gradient of E, of divergence of E, rather. And that's going to equal rho. So I substitute this into there. And now epsilon is a function of space, and so I have to do the chain rule. I have to do the multiplication rule. I have to take the derivative of epsilon times E, and then I have to take the derivative of E times epsilon. So that's what I have. And then in one dimension, I'll have EX, D epsilon DX, plus epsilon, DEX, DX. And that's equal to my forcing term rho. Okay. Rearrange. Rearrange and I have this equation. Now this is a first order differential equation. It's ordinary. It's forced. And it has non-constant coefficients. Okay. So that's, that's what we're looking for. Now it turns out this is of the form that can always be solved with what we used to call an integrating factor. Okay. This is kind of a nice thing to remember, that this is one of those differential equations that always, always has a solution, regardless of what the function, the forcing term is, and regardless of what the function is here. It always has a solution. And the solution is of the form Here's my integrating factor. Here's my convolution integral. my boundary condition. 
So if you reach to your uh, CRC Handbook of, math of Mathematics and you find there's a page on there on differential equations and this is one of the solutions. It's the exact, it's an exact differential equation, I think they call it. If you go back to your differential equation books, early, early on in the semester, before you were even waking up to the course, they snuck this separable exact equation in there. And they taught you about integrating factors. And it was so easy and so simple that you shrugged it off, answered a few questions on your midterm, and promptly forgot about it. So I'm just dragging all that back up again. This integrating factor actually can be done a little bit, it's actually being looked at a little bit neater. e to the 1 over epsilon d epsilon dx dx integrated. That's going to equal the same thing as the integral of d epsilon um, over epsilon of x. And so that can be integrated into an integral of the ln of epsilon of x plus some constant. The 1 over x dependence is a log, gives you the log behavior. And so that's equal to epsilon of x e to whatever that constant is. <coughs> which is just equal to a different constant times epsilon of x. So the answer, ex of x, is some constant over epsilon of x times the integral of rho of x over epsilon of x times epsilon of x dx plus that constant up there. Which is equal to just k1 over epsilon of x times the integral of rho of x dx plus some other constant. The answer is unimportant. The fact that we were able to get an answer is interesting. And what's most important is the manipulations that you have to do. Well, first of all, the kind of equation that you get, the non-constant coefficients, that's what I promised you with this inhomogeneous material. And then the kinds of things that you might have to do to, if, you, if you wanted to solve it, if you could possibly solve it. Very, very easy, by the way, to assume a distribution where you can't have a solution. One that really confounds us is crystal lattices. They have a periodic distribution of matter. Every host atom, rise, fall, rise, fall. If you put that in, to your material relations, you're going to have a sine of x as your coefficient of your differential equation. And that's a Hill equation. And very, very, very few Hill equations have been solved. Really ugly. You stumble on it, and it's like, oh my god, it should be easy because it's easy to get here. Nope. Really, really painful. Okay. All right, so let's. So that was for the inhomogeneous case. That was for the inhomogeneous case. Now let's find it. Quantity. 
And I'm just going to stick to a, a, the simplest term of the Taylor series. Okay? So epsilon is proportional to epsilon e, which means d is proportional to e squared. Okay, that makes it a nonlinear equation. So now I'll go back to my del d equals rho term. And I'll put in my form for my dielectric constant. I have two terms here. And now I have some chain rule work to do. So I've got to break these guys up into this term and this term. And now I can collect some terms. These two terms go together. They both have a divergence of E in there. bookkeeping that we have to keep track of. And in one dimension, that dot product becomes easier. The divergence becomes easier. Sorry. So this guy here just reduces down to this. Divert divergence reduces this to the first derivative. This guy just becomes the EX term. And then this guy is just the first derivative of that one component of the dot product. And that's equal to rho x. If this is not a function of x, then I, this just this can be pulled through the integral. That's sorry, the derivative. So I can collect some terms here.
and we got very, very, very lucky. Because I can multiply through by dx, and I have an equation. I have a. I can. I have something that's. I can integrate with respect to ex, and on this side I can integrate with respect to x. In other words, this is a separable equation. Very, very, very lucky. We dumbed down the problem in both of those cases so much that we're able to do something with them. Okay? The details of this, by the way, you shouldn't stress about. I just want you to get a flavor for the kind of mathematics that come in when you have some of these complexities. And these were about the simplest problems that I could come up with. Which is why I asked them years and years and years ago in an undergraduate test. I probably shouldn't have done that. So I do the integration and I happen to get a quadratic. And we all know how to solve for the roots of the quadratic. We have to worry about which one, which is a plus, which, whether we want the plus one or the minus one. That's something interesting, oh, important point. Something interesting about nonlinear equations is you don't have to always have unique solutions. We found two solutions to the field, right? So which one do we know is right? Well, sometimes we can figure it out and pick one, and sometimes we really can't. Sometimes the field is really bistable. But if epsilon 1 is much less than epsilon naught, which is probably reasonable, Then what we can do is we can um, approximate that, that um, square root. And in the limit of epsilon 1 going to 0 implies the negative sign is what we want. Okay. 